Gary Abraham is a, a solo uh, practitioner of law um, with an office in Allegheny, New York. He practices environmental, uh, municipal, and land use law uh, throughout uh, New York State, including practice before uh, New York State DEC, limited to public interest cases. Um, after, law, after he graduated from law school, uh, Abraham served as legislative counsel to con Congressman John uh, LaFalse in Buffalo uh, and Washington, D.C., Natural Resources Law Institute fellow um, on the LLM uh, faculty of the Northwestern School of Law um, in Portland, Oregon, staff attorney at Southern Tier Legal Services in Olean, New York, um, and of counsel at the firm of Allen and Lippis in, in Buffalo, New York. Among his current Clients are over half a dozen community groups and municipalities around the state opposing overly intrusive siting of utility scale wind farms. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Abraham up for his 15 minutes of fame. Thank you. There's an automatic slide advancer. I don't know. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been practicing law for about uh, 15 years and have concentrated on uh, landfills until recently when I got involved in wind farms, but I still have uh, several landfill cases. One of my clients is uh, Finger Lakes Zero Waste Coalition, um, and I wanted to disclose that because uh, uh, Finger Lakes uh, Zero Waste is um, obviously committed to achieve a policy goal of zero waste for landfilling. Uh, I was asked to speak on the uh, local authority to regulate waste management. And I'll start with the statement of a problem uh, that I think uh, should be addressed. Uh, commercially operated landfills can be expected to take the kinds of waste that generate the highest fees. This has become apparent at those landfills accepting Marcellus shale wastes. Drill cuttings are the largest component of such wastes. Drill cuttings are four times as dense as conventional waste. Landfill disposal fees are charged on a tonnage basis, that is by weight. However, landfills are permitted in terms of airspace. Every annual report required under a DEC landfill permit must calculate the amount of remaining permitted airspace. Since one-fourth of the airspace needed for conventional waste is taken up by drill cuttings, when the tonnage rate is the same, landfills can make four times as much accepting drill cuttings as they can when accepting conventional waste. Regardless of the kinds of waste they accept, commercially operated landfills can also be expected to use up their permitted airspace as quickly as possible, and then to apply for an expansion. Their commercial behavior is rather one-dimensional, maximizing profits without regard to public planning goals. These incentives have resulted in mega landfills, landfills larger than anyone has seen in human history. No one has any experience with such landfills for as long as they remain hazardous. EPA examined leachate from municipal solid waste landfills and from hazardous waste landfills and could not find any difference in the chemical makeup of the two leachates. Municipalities should consider landfills they own to be a valuable resource to be managed by extending their life as long as possible. Thus, municipalities have an interest in waste diversion and recycling that private landfill operators lack. Municipalities that have decided not to host a landfill at all have even stronger incentives to reduce waste that must be landfilled. I want to focus on kind of the real life situation in Ontario County with the Ontario County landfill as an example. I don't want to litigate the Ontario County landfill here, but I think it's a useful example uh, for some of the principles I want to talk about. According to Ontario County records, Casella has sent a letter informing the county that the landfill will not accept waste resulting from hydrofracking activities without permission from the county. However, only about 8.81% of the waste landfilled in the county's landfill originates in the county. This compares to the statewide recycling rate, uh, which was 36% in 2008. Much of the remainder of the waste that goes to the Ontario County landfill is diverted from the Chemung County landfill, the Highland landfill in Ang Allegheny County, and uh, the Hakes C&D landfill in Steuben County, all three of which accept hydrofracking wastes from Pennsylvania. 
All three are operated by Casella, which diverts municipal solid waste and non-hydrofracking industrial wastes from these three landfills to the Ontario County landfill, which it operates, in order to maximize the space available in the other landfills for hydrofracking waste. The Ontario County landfill is thus an integral part of Casella's waste management plan. It should be noted that Casella's attorney also represents fracking companies such as Chesapeake and Fortuna. Casella's waste transfer practices can be expected to minimize the projected life of the landfill compared to the county's interest and needs, which should be to maximize the life of the landfill. The county will therefore need to analyze the effect of Casella's waste transfer practices on the projected life of the landfill. Let's uh, turn for a minute to the authority of towns to prohibit landfills and landfill expansions. And again, I'll, I'll turn uh, in a minute to uh, the Ontario County landfill. Landfill developers try to convince towns that New York regulations provide stringent and more than adequate protections for local health and the environment. However, they generally fail to acknowledge that towns in New York have separate independent permitting authority alongside New York's DEC. Unless a town authorizes it under its local law, a DEC landfill permit is not enough to authorize construction and operation of a landfill. In fact, landfill permits issued by the DEC all state that nothing in the permit affects the obligation of the permittee to comply with local laws. Towns uh, can, thus towns can impose their own more stringent regulations on landfills. Towns can restrict both the siting and operation of landfills. A town's authority to regulate landfills goes as far as an outright ban, including a ban on expansions. On May 8, 2000, a decision in the case Modern Landfill versus Town of Eagle noted with approval that even the landfill developer, quote, accepted that the town could regulate landfills to protect public health, safety, and welfare as an exercise of its police powers. Accordingly, in 2002, two years later, the Town of Eagle enacted a landfill ban modeled after the successfully litigated 1997 Town of Root law. Root, uh, town of Root is near Albany. There are a couple of dozen, at least a couple of dozen towns in New York that have banned landfills or their expansion. Um, a town's ban on landfills is not treated like a zoning law, but rather as an exercise of the authority delegated to the town by the state constitution, municipal home rule law, and the state's town law. Therefore, a town need not support a local landfill ban with copious technical or engineering documents as it might need to in support of a zoning decision. It is sufficient for the town to note among its findings supporting the local law that substantial uncertainty exists regarding environmental health effects, environmental and health effects of solid waste management facilities, and regarding the ability of scientific experts or the DEC to determine the extent of such effects. This will establish the town's intent to exercise its authority to protect the health and safety of residents of the town, known as the police power. Municipalities implementing their police power by means of local legislation enjoy a strong presumption of validity, and a heavy burden is laid on those who challenge those enactments in court. According to the U.S. Supreme Court, when a community legislates pursuant to its police powers, quote, it is to be remembered that we are dealing with one of the most essential powers of government, one that is the least limitable. These well-settled principles have been attacked by Ontario County in a discussion of the town of Seneca's zoning authority, which the county says is preempted by the public need to expand the landfill. I will discuss later whether there is sufficient public need to support expanding the landfill, but that's not relevant to the county's preemption argument. Here, it's important to note that the county relies on, quote, the reasoning of In Re County of Monroe, 1988, as a balancing of public interests favors exemption from local zoning. However, the county recently lost the same argument before Judge Falvey in a lawsuit brought by the town of Italy, which challenged the county's ability to unilaterally determine the balance of interest to support a proposal to erect a communications tower in the town. Judge Falvey ruled that the host town, quote, may test in court, in a court of law, whether the county is exempt from the town's zoning ordinance under the balance of public interest test stated by the county of Monroe decision. 
It is therefore clear that the county may not unilaterally determine that the balance of interests supports a proposal to expand the landfill in the town of Seneca. In its lengthy argument in favor of that determination in the final environmental impact statement for the expansion, therefore remains untested and tentative. However, as I indicated above, if the town of Seneca wants to restrict expansion to landfill, its better course of action is to do so outside its zoning code and instead adopt an independent local land use law pursuant to its police powers. Following this course would put the applicability of the County of Monroe decision further in doubt. Let me turn now to what um, I would recommend the county do instead of expanding the landfill. The county should consider flow control as a planning tool for solid waste management. Flow control involves the enactment of a local municipal law, usually by a county, requiring that all waste generated within or transported to the county's, to the county's jurisdiction be managed at county-owned facilities. In Ontario County, this would require all waste, whether for landfilling, recycling, product reuse, or other purposes to be managed at the county's transfer stations or alternative waste management facilities, such as an electronics recycling facility or its landfill. This would end export of waste of all kinds to other counties. In the 1990s, flow control laws were attacked as a violation of the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which generally prohibits discrimination against out-of-state commerce. In the case United Haulers Association versus Oneida Herkimer Solid Waste Management Authority, the Second Circuit held that a New York County's flow control law is not impermissible discrimination under the Commerce Clause because the restrictions it imposes apply equally to in-state and out-of-state commerce and waste. Flow control laws, therefore, do not discriminate in violation of the Commerce Clause and are an appropriate exercise of municipal police powers. It is thus now clear that flow control is available as a tool to achieve meaningful progress toward an increased recycling and diversion rate. If the county requires all recyclables to be managed at county-owned facilities, for example, it will increase the volume of recyclables the county manages and ensure a predictable stream of materials that will allow the county to take advantage of volume pricing to enhance revenue from managing recyclables. The same can be said of compostables and other waste streams that have uses supporting diversion from landfilling and have markets. Stated differently, the county has authority to capture much more of the planning unit's waste stream than it does currently. The county should consider flow control in the context of developing its local solid waste management plan, which you heard earlier it's in the, progress, it's in the process of doing. Uh, under DEC's landfill regulations, DEC cannot approve a municipality's proposal to site or expand a landfill, regardless of who operates the landfill, until the, the municipality has in place a DEC-approved local solid waste management plan. DEC's regulations specify in detail the required opponent, components of the plan. The plan must include a comprehensive recycling plan, and an opportunity for the public to comment on the adequacy of that plan. The larger solid waste management plan must also identify imports and exports of waste for each municipality and each industry, including, for example, food processors in the county, as well as what each municipality does within the county to market materials recovered and diverted from landfilling. DEC also requires the local solid waste management plan to include a full discussion of plans for expanding the landfill. DEC also requires, quote, a full pay-as-you-go or pay-as-you-throw evaluation in the plan. DEC has advised the county that pay-as-you-throw programs have proven to be successful in a wide range of communities. DEC will not accept a proposed comprehensive recycling analysis, which is a component of the plan, as complete without finding the municipality has adequately addressed the extent to which local laws foster and encourage recycling. To comply with this requirement, the county's recycling analysis much, must include actions to be taken to maximize to the extent practicable the development and enhancement of economic markets for recycl recyclables recovered from within the service area under local laws or ordinances adopted or to be, 
or to be adopted. Um, an economic market for recyclables under the regulations exists when the costs of collection, transportation, and sale of recyclable materials is equal to or less than the, quote, full avoided costs, unquote, of alternative means of waste management. The term full avoided costs includes all costs associated with siting, permitting, construction, operation, maintenance, expansion, closure, and post-closure monitoring of a landfill. So all of the costs that are connected with having a landfill and expanding it uh, are the touchstone against which avoided costs are measured. Additionally, a cost avoidance analysis must be included for any component of the waste stream that an applicant contends is too expensive to be to recycle. The county has not provided any full avoided costs analysis in its local solid waste management plan yet. DEC has advised the county that it may not rely on market analyses performed by private recyclers in the county. It has to do its own analysis. A proposal to site or expand a landfill is arguably an obstacle to achieving any meaningful recycling rate. The county believes that expanding the landfill and, and expanding recycling are unrelated to each other because, quote, it costs residents less to recycle than to dispose of waste in the landfill as recycling does not involve a tipping fee. Since the incentive to county residents is to reduce the waste they generate for landfilling, the county believes it can detach planning to expand the landfill from planning for expanding landfill diversion efforts like recycling. Accordingly, the final environmental impact state statement for the landfill expansion proposal lacks any discussion of the county's local solid waste management plan, except in the response to comments. However, as noted earlier, environmental, state environmental law and regulations implement, uh, do, do not treat a local solid waste management plan and a landfill expansion proposal as separate. Ontario County, uh, and I'm almost done. Ontario County prepared a proposed final uh, local solid waste management plan last month. The plan relies on landfilling all waste generated in the county that cannot be recovered or recycled, but appears to reserve any decision to expand the landfill, stating that its plan regarding the landfill is to apply for expansion permits as necessary to provide for un uninterrupted landfill disposal capacity at the landfill throughout the 10-year planning period. What is necessary? The answer to that should be determined by the success of the county's diversion and recycling efforts. This point relates back to the local solid waste management plan requirements under DEC's regulations. DEC does not agree with the county that recycling and other diversion efforts can be separated from landfill planning. As discussed earlier, the county is required to have a DEC approved local solid waste management plan as a precondition for approval of the landfill expansion. And before DEC can approve a plan, the county is required to show how it will develop markets for recycling. Adopting flow control is one of the most effective means to develop markets for recycling because it allows the county to capture the entire recyclable waste stream and thereby maximize its position in the various markets for recyclables. The county's proposed plan commits the county to increase its recycling rate, uh, support new yard waste composting efforts, increase household waste collection, increase recycling of construction and demolition debris, increase product reuse efforts, all good things. Encourage management of unique wastes like pharmaceutical waste outside the landfill program, increase public house outreach and education regarding waste management options, promote recycling of agricultural plastics wastes, uh, and more. Uh, and last but not least, it commits itself to update the local solid waste management plan. Among the updates to the county's uh, update the local solid waste management law, that is. Among the updates to the county's law, flow control should be considered. The approach the county has taken avoids acknowledging that the landfill is a county resource except as a revenue stream. Clearly, this approach will not encourage DEC approval of the local solid waste management plan that's required. The county should therefore abandon the fiction that waste reduction and diversion from landfilling have nothing to do with its landfill. It should instead consider how flow control and other diversion practices, uh, 
How, it should consider instead how flow control and other diversion practices can extend the life of the landfill and enhance its benefits for county residents. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Gary. Uh, being a, a board member on the Onondaga County Resource Recovery Agency, I kind of feel like flow control is one of the strongest tools that we have to uh, have such a high diversion rate um, there. Uh, so in any case, let's move on to our second to last speaker. With that said, I want to take this, this period of time to ask you if you have questions on cards to pre please raise them up. Uh, we have Adam and Lisa coming around to collect them. They also have additional blank cards if you filled up your space or if you're giving up a card and you think you might have a question with the next two speakers. Um, so Adam uh, and Lisa are coming around. If you have cards, please raise them up. Uh, in the meantime, we're typing all of those up so that we can uh, capture them for our uh, imminent Q&A uh, discussion period of the evening.